Thinking on the promises of God. What a marvelous thought that God has given us great and precious promises and we can rely on them absolutely because God is absolute and he is sovereign and everything that he has promised he will do. Take your Bibles and turn with me if you will to Acts chapter 28. Tonight we're looking at part two of all here but only some believe. Acts 28 verses 17 through 24. Acts chapter 28 verses 17 through 24. And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together and when they were come together he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews speak against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening. And some believed the things which were spoken and some believe not. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we hear your word, you will cause us to be among those who believe, not among those who believe not. How easy it is for us to harden our hearts when we hear something that goes against our experience, or when we hear something that goes against our self-will, or when we hear something that goes against the philosophy of the world that we have absorbed, when we hear something we don't like, and we harden our hearts. Father, I pray that you will cause the hearts of every one of us here tonight to be open. And if we see something that is wrong, to repent. And to learn, Father, from your word that we might be those who believe the application of the word of God in every circumstance and every situation of life. Father, we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice in that verse 23, when they had come together on a specific appointed day, he did not reason with them out of the secular philosophers. It, he says he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus out of the law of Moses and of the prophets. Now, about two years ago, we were in the Gospel of Luke. And in the last chapter of Luke, we find Jesus on the road to Emmaus with two whose eyes were holden. They did not recognize him as he joined them. They had heard about the resurrection, but they had left Jerusalem. They had heard that the tomb was empty, but they were walking home. They were even discussing that they thought that Jesus would have been the Messiah, but they did not believe the reports that they had heard that he had risen from the dead. And as they walked and communed with one another, Jesus joined himself to them. And he asked them, what are these things that you talk about as you walk and are sad? And they asked him, are you just new in Jerusalem? 
Haven't you heard the things that have been happening there in the last few days? And Jesus said, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in word and deed. And we thought he was going to be the Messiah, but our rulers turned him over to the Romans and they killed him. In fact, this morning we heard that, you know, it's been three days and suddenly people are saying he rose from the dead. But we're on our way home. They didn't believe. And Jesus himself, it says, he said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Shouldn't this Messiah have been crucified and dead and buried and rise from the dead on the third day. And he says to them, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What Paul is doing here is exactly the same thing that Jesus did with the two on the road to Emmaus. Did you get it? He says... It was from the morning until the night he expounded on them and persuaded to them about Jesus out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. Paul was sharing with them in precisely the same way that Jesus shared with the two on the road to Emmaus. And when they got to Emmaus, Jesus made as though he would go further and they said, no, 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 please, please have dinner with us tonight. Stay the night. It's, it's late. You know, you don't want to be walking in the middle of the night. Come on, stay at our house. And they went in to have supper. And it says, as Jesus broke the bread, their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. This morning we broke the bread together. This morning we had the Lord's table together. We did what Jesus was reenacting for them, perhaps the very first reenactment of the Last Supper as Jesus sat and broke bread with those two three days after he was crucified. And they said, did not our heart burn within us while he walked with us by the way and talked? And they got up that same hour. They walked in the middle of the night because they ran back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles that they had seen the risen Christ. Paul is not concerning, talking concerning a philosophical view of the world and how we ought to live better just because of philosophy. It says he spoke to them, he persuaded them concerning Jesus. Jesus can be found in the law of Moses. You find him in Genesis 1.1. John says so in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He goes to that first day of creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And he says that was Jesus who said that. Jesus is in all the prophets. We've looked through every Old Testament book. We've seen Jesus in each of the prophetic books. We've seen Jesus in each of the books of the law, the five books of Moses. He's there. Jesus did that for them. Now Paul is doing it. He preached a sermon that lasted from early morning all the way until nighttime. Aren't you glad I don't preach sermons like that? All right, let's do a quick review before we move into seeing the connection between why some hear, but only all hear, but only some believe. It gets us into the doctrine of election and predestination. It also gets us into the doctrine of inspiration, illumination, preservation. There's some very important key doctrines that are tied up for us here in this passage. The first thing that we noticed last week is that Paul uses the same method as before he went to the Jews first. And most of us are familiar with that phrase, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But we saw that it applied to two different areas. We saw Paul using that phraseology in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul always tried to preach the gospel to the Jews first because they would already have had a foundation laid to understand and receive it. We see that here in his message. He gives them all the way back to the Pentateuch and all the way through the prophets. He didn't have to establish a foundation. They knew the foundation. They knew what the scriptures prophesied. He's tying it together for them. 
And so Paul did that continuously. We pointed out that most Jewish boys had memorized large portions of the scripture. Some have memorized the entire Old Testament even down till today. Puts us to shame. Most of us don't memorize a, a verse a month. To whom much is given, from him shall much be required. Because the Jews had been given the law and all the special revelation of the Old Testament, they had a greater accountability than the Gentiles and would suffer greater punishment for rejecting the Messiah. And Paul clearly states that a privilege in Romans. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And therefore the Jews, as we saw, would have priority in chastening for wrongdoing. Romans 2, 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. There's that phrase again, as we saw before. All here, but only some believe. It was to the, Apollo, the Romans that the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle. It was Roman Jews who demonstrated this truth in real life. Paul is now going to be tried in Rome. Listen to what he says in verse 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Remember we just read here in our text for tonight. All of them heard, but only some believed. So he asked the question. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Does that cancel the truth of the gospel? And he tells you in verse 4, God forbid... Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. It doesn't matter what man does, it doesn't change the truth. There are many people today teaching different doctrines. There are many people today denying that God even exists. Does it change the truth? No, and Paul makes that very clear here. To the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. The third passage where we saw to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles was in Romans 2.10. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. That verse gives us the flip side of the coin. If the Jews got spanked for the fir first for their disobedience, they also get rewarded first for their obedience. The greater the obedience, the greater the reward. There's coming a day when the Jews will receive the great tribulation. The church will be out of here by then. We'll be talking about that on Sunday evenings, the Lord willing, when we finish the book of Acts. We'll be talking about the book of Revelation. We'll be going through what happens and when does it happen. We're on the cusp of the cup. I think things are about to change very rapidly in the world. We see some of that beginning to build right now. And there's coming the next great event in prophetic history, which is the rapture from Rapio to Caesar to Snatch. It's a translation, a Latin translation of the Greek word harpazo, which is found over in 2 Thessalonians. When we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But we'll save that for when we get to Revelation. But we see all the different possibilities here. To the Jew first and also to the Greek comes salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek comes chasing for refusal to believe the gospel of Christ. To the Jew first, also to the Greek, comes the rewards for those who do, in fact, believe. The Jews had the privilege of the oracles of God, the entire Old Testament. They had the privilege of knowing the law of God, the prophets of God, the books that are called the writings, like the historical books of the Old Testament, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and so on like that. They had the privilege of knowing that the Messiah would be Jewish. They had the Messiah actually show up in Israel and initially reject his ministry to Jews alone. Even on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was for Jewish men only. You look at Acts chapter 2. It's all Jewish men. They're all in the courtyard of the men. On the day of Pentecost, one of the great uh, high, high feasts of Israel, 3,000 Jewish males believed on that day. Incredible. They had the, also, therefore, the greatest foundation in 2,000 years of divine revelation and priority of access before any of the Gentiles who don't come in until Acts chapter 10. Therefore, they've had the greatest chastening for rejecting. This chastening has been going on for the last 2,000 years during what the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles. That also means that when they believe, they'll also have intense blessing. 
Romans chapter 2, verse 10 again. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. Second thing we noticed last week was that Paul went first to the leadership. Paul didn't just try to raise up a, a ground movement swell to go out and hold picket signs and yell and scream about what they didn't like. Paul went to the leaders first. came to pass after three days that Paul called the chief of the Jews together. Those are the ones he gathered together to give to them the first opportunity for the gospel. You see, one of the accusations against Paul had been that he was subverting the people. Paul makes it very clear that that's not what he's doing. The principle of all hearing but only some believe is a major theme of the first three chapters of Romans and then developed in the book of Romans as Paul deals with the doctrine of predestination. He makes sure, and God makes sure, and takes great pains to assure that everybody hears by one means or another. And we are given three different means by which people hear about the truth of who God is. First is the light of creation in Romans chapter 1. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, if even his eternal power and Godhead, so that, say the next phrase with me, they are without excuse. Everybody has access to the creation all around the world and have had that access ever since the world was created. They can see God's eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. If a man follows the light that he has been given, he gets more light. If he rejects the light that he has been given, he goes into further darkness. And we see that happening with people all around us. Romans chapter 2 is the light of? Chapter 1 is the light of creation. Chap Conscience, that's right. Romans chapter 2 deals with something else that every man has access to, which is a conscience. He knows right and wrong. And when he sears his conscience to choose wrong, he goes into further darkness. Romans chapter 3 is special revelation. That is what was given to the Jews. And Paul says the Jews have, have a great responsibility as well as a great privilege. Because Romans chapter 3, he talks about how God gave special revelation to the Jews. Every one of us has had some light. Now you and I, living post-cross, living post-resurrection, living post-spread of the gospel, which has reached all around the world, we actually have God's word in our hands. We can read the Bible. We know English. Are we held accountable? Are all those around us in the United States of America where they can walk into a bookstore and pick up a Bible? You can go to Dollar Tree and buy an entire Bible for one dollar. There's nobody in the United States that can't afford a Bible. Are we responsible? Yes. Are we accountable? Yes. Will every man, woman, and child stand before God someday and give an account? Yes. What an awesome responsibility to live in a land where God's word is freely and readily available and to reject it because you first rejected the light of creation. Why do you think they teach evolution in the public schools? You rejected the light of conscience. Why do you think there's such argumentation as to whether or not sodomy is okay and gay marriage is okay and transgenderism is okay and so on? That's a searing of the conscience. Why do you think the liberals are out there trying to say the Bible is not true and it's got mistakes in it? Satan does not want you to believe the revelation which God has given of himself and of all that he did. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into that which is like a man and four-footed beast and creeping things. <laughs> you go from men to animals to bugs. In India, they worship dung beetles. In Egypt, they worshiped dung beetles. The scarab, you see it carved on the Egyptian tombs. What a plunge into darkness from the glory of the ineffable God. 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein, that is in, the gospel of Christ, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And that word for holding the truth is a wrestling term. It means to suppress the truth. Romans 2, everybody hears in the light of conscience. Romans 3, we find the marvel of God giving special revelation. Now that brings us to the important doctrines of election and predestination, which are closely tied to the doctrines of revelation, inspiration, and illumination. We find all of those doctrines are listed for us in Romans chapter 2. I'll not read the entire chapter because we did that last week. But we find at the end of the chapter, he says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not a law, are a law unto themselves. They know it in their hearts which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So that's a threefold revelation and accountability system established by God, and that's the basis for Paul's exposition of the doctrines of election and predestination in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. All are accountable, all here by one means or another, Therefore, all are guilty. Only some believe because only some are among God's elect. Now, people argue about this. They say, that's not fair of God. Really? Do you know better than God? Let me ask a question. Men were all sinners. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. We're born dead in trespasses and sins. We are descended from Adam and Eve. The first couple, who though they were innocent, chose to sin. And every one of us, at the moment of our birth, were born dead in trespasses and sins. We had an old sin nature. We were not innocent like Adam and Eve. Then as we began to grow, we made choices. And a great number of those choices were bad choices. They were choices to sin, to do things that God says are bad. When we were little kids, we looked out and we thought, man, there must be a big God out there somewhere. And then we had the opportunity, we were in the store one day with our parents and we saw some trinket that we as a little kid thought was really nice And when nobody was looking, we grabbed it and we stuck it in our pocket. We stole. And then we got home and our mom looked at us and said, where'd you get that? Uh, My friend gave it to me. Oh, then we lied. And as we got older, we began to break all the other rules that God had set down. And every time we did it, our conscience gave a little twinge. We kept stomping on our conscience until it no longer bothered us to do all those little things. And we began to do bigger things and bigger things and really big things. All the time we're shaking our fist at God. Now, is God obligated to save anybody like that? Is he obligated to save anybody like that? Suppose you had a beautiful grand piano, just like that one even better. And one day an army of termites comes in and begins to chew up your piano. And you discover it after the piano is about halfway chewed up. Are you obligated to save even one termite? Everybody thinks, well maybe some of you have been swayed by the liberals who think you should never even kill bugs, but um, (laughs) Irrationally, are you under an obligation to save even one termite? Everybody who thinks you have an obligation, that you have a moral obligation to save at least one termite, raise your hand. What, nobody? 
<laughs> the preacher, oh, I, don't, I don't think we have an obligation to save a termite. What do you do with them? You call the exterminator. And you pay the exterminator to kill every one of the termites. Do you understand that we are worse than the termites? The termites have only eaten some wood. Hey, that's what they do. In fact, that's what they do for a living. You and I have rebelled against and offended a holy God who made heaven and earth and gave us this beautiful planet and put us in dominion over it and we've trashed it and we've shaken our fist at God and we've told God he doesn't exist and we've decided to live worse than the animals. Even animals don't systematically kill all their young like the abortion movement does today. God isn't obligated to even one termite human. So if he chooses to save anybody, it's a matter of grace. Not a matter of obligation, but a matter of grace. So we have no reason to complain that the holy, perfect, righteous God who made everything perfect and made it good, we have no reason to complain when he decides to burn trash. But in his grace chooses to save some. You see, people who complain about God's electing purposes are saying that God is not wise. They're saying they're wiser. They're also starting with the wrong premise. They are assuming that men deserve to be saved. And none of us deserve to be saved. What we deserve is hell. The question is not, how can a loving God send anybody to hell? Wrong question because it starts with the wrong premises. It assumes that some ought to go to heaven. The correct premise is, how can a just and righteous God send anybody to heaven? Not how can a loving God send anybody to hell, but how can a righteous God send anybody to heaven? And that question has been answered by the cross of Christ. God himself paid the penalty for sinful men that we might go to heaven. He's just and he's righteous and he can be just in justifying the ungodly because the sin has been paid for at the cross of Calvary. Make sure you start with the right premises because otherwise you must come to the wrong conclusion and ultimately what you do is you accuse God for being unjust. And that's what Paul explains in Romans chapter 9. Beginning in verse 18, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Paul's making the same argument that I just made to you. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Same lump of clay. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? He gave them a long time. If at any time they had chosen in their hearts to turn to him, they, many, many wicked people live long lives. Did you know that? God has mercy on the vessels of destruction. They're going to end in hell. 
they have opportunity after opportunity. Someone tries to give them a tract and they reject it. You know, it's very rarely that someone rejects one of these little tract calendars that uh, we have, you know, calendar on the front, address and website of the church on the front. On the back is a plan of salvation. I had one of those instances happen to me this past week as I was driving back from JFK Airport in New York City where I let Daniel and Anastasia and the boys off to fly to Ukraine for the wedding. And the second wedding was today. The first one was yesterday. Kolya's older sister, Katya, they had to have a government wedding on Saturday. Then they could have the church wedding on Sunday. Not allowed to have a church wedding until you have a government wedding. On the way back, I stopped at a toll booth getting off the New Jersey Turnpike. I pulled up and there was an Indian woman, a woman from India, the old Don on the Forehead stuff, and uh, indicating probably she was Hindu. And uh, I offered her one of the calendars. She looked at it, she sneered and says, I don't want this. Shoved it back at me. I said, it's got a calendar on it. Hey, it's good for the whole rest of the year. I don't want it. Do you think that someday she'll have to give an account for that? People have opportunities, especially in this country, right and left, and they reject it. Is God obligated to give them even one chance? <laughs> and how many chances does everybody here in this country have? It's on radio, it's on television, it's in books, it's in newspapers. There's Christian literature flooding all over this country. It's on the internet. They drive by churches every day of their lives and they don't want it. Are they accountable? Yes, they are. But are you and I accountable for still trying to share the gospel with them? Yes, we are. You have it easier in this country than any place else in the world. There are some places that even owning a Bible puts on you a death sentence. You can own stacks of Bibles and nobody cares. that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore, that it means before time, prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In eternity past, God made some choices because nobody would have been saved if he did not. You know, if there were not those who were the elect, Christ could have come and died on the cross and paid the penalty for sin, and nobody would have believed, and yet they would all be held even more accountable because a payment had been made and they did not avail themselves of it. The great equalizer is the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. The very next few verses. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which followed not after the righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, they had the whole law. They had the Old Testament prophets. They tried to follow the law of righteousness as a means of salvation. He says so. Which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. They're trying to get saved by doing good stuff. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Who is the stumbling stone? Paul quotes the Old Testament. He quotes Isaiah, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. It's Jesus whom Isaiah was prophesying, and it is that passage that Paul quotes, amazingly, to Gentile believers in Romans 9. 
Now let's see how that ties to election and predestination. We're going to talk first about election, which is probably as far as we'll get tonight. Hopefully we'll get to predestination next week when we do the last uh, couple of messages in this series before we end the book of Acts. But um, how does all this tie in with election and predestination? So first we're going to talk about the word elect and election because it is used in multiple different ways in the New Testament. But each one of them has the same foundational basis. The doctrine of election, the doctrine of predestination. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ is called the elect, or the elect one. We find it prophesied in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Isaiah writes, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, if you read Isaiah 42, you know he's talking about, it's a messianic prophet, prophecy about the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter quotes it that way over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So the first one, who is called the elect, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The word elect means to be called out from a group for a specific purpose. Our Lord Jesus Christ is set forth as the Messiah for the specific purposes, all of which were prophesied in the Old Testament, which were fulfilled in the New Testament, and those that relate to the return of Christ will be fulfilled yet in the future. But all the prophecies dealing with his first coming have been literally and specifically fulfilled. The second way in which the term elect is used in the Old Testament is the nation of Israel is called the elect. For example, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect. I have even called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. So Israel is called the elect. We see it again 20 chapters later in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. God has a group of people, those who are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he calls them his elect because he's chosen that nation and he's chosen it for a purpose. Remember, that's the key to the doctrine of election. How about Isaiah chapter 65, verse 22? They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. That is a millennial promise. When you get to Isaiah chapter 65 and chapter 66, you're dealing with a literal millennium on earth in which the Lord Jesus Christ, having come back at the second coming, will reign on earth for a thousand years. Satan being chained and bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years during that period of time. And here we find Israel is being called the elect and that they're going to be working the land and they're going to, have, they're going to live as long as trees. Trees live long times, folks. Isaiah tells us that a, a person who dies at age 100 at that time is going to be considered a child a 100-year-old child, because people live so long. Third, the Jews who will be saved during the tribulation period are called the elect. The Lord Jesus Christ, in what is called the Mount of Olivet Discourse, or the Olivet Discourse, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, listen to what he says in verse 22. In fact, 22 and 24. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, if you read the Olivet Discourse, you very quickly can conclude that Jesus is not talking about the church going through the tribulation. We'll be discussing this more in detail when we get into the book of Revelation in a couple of weeks. He's talking about Israel. He's referring to Old Testament prophecies that relate to Israel as a nation, a nation in unbelief that ultimately, through the, the horrible things that happened during the tribulation will finally, the book of Hosea prophesies this, during the last three days of the tribulation will turn to Christ in mass. They'll realize that no longer can they protect themselves. I mean, there are brilliant Jews in the world today. They've got what they call the Iron Dome over Jerusalem, which is a complex missile system that can stop anything that's coming in to try to bomb the city of Jerusalem. 
They're brilliant scientists, brilliant musicians, brilliant artists. I mean, God gave that people brilliance, brilliance, brilliance. But there's coming a day when they can no longer protect themselves and they call out for the Messiah for three days and Christ returns from heaven to deliver Israel. That's at the end of the tribulation. We'll be gone. We'll have gone up at the rapture, beginning of the tribulation. Tribulation takes place, wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven, tribulation on earth. End of that seven year period, the Messiah returns. I'm not gonna give away all the sermons in the future, but that gives you a general picture of where we're going when we get to the book of Revelation. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Jesus is talking about the chosen people of Israel during the tribulation period. Verse 31, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. A lot of exciting things. I've only given you a few verses. We'll be covering the Olivet Discourse when we go through the book of Revelation because a lot of things fit together. We find many things out of the book of Daniel, many things out of the book of Jeremiah, many things out of the book of Isaiah. Uh, there are multiple references in the book of Revelation to all these Old Testament prophets because it's fulfillment of prophetic things that were told to Israel, to the nation of Israel, long before the church ever existed, to the nation Israel, of what would happen during the time of Jacob's sorrow if they rejected the coming Messiah. The scripture is a unit. It is true. It ties together. There are no mistakes. And God will fulfill every one of the prophecies exactly like he promised he would do. Over in Mark, we see the same things. I'll just read the verses quickly. Except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh shall be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. The elects are those whom God has chosen. It's always for a purpose. Verse 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall arise, shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Verse 27, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost parts of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So Jews saved during the tribulation are called the elect. Number four, believers in Christ are also called the elect. Luke 18, seven, and shall not God save his own elect, which cry night, day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Whole churches are called elect. Second John 1, 1, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all them that have known the truth. Now, when you study first, second and third John, you recognize he's writing to churches, but he calls them elect ladies. In 2 John 1.13, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Unfallen angels are also called elect angels. 1 Timothy 5.21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing but partiality. Interesting to see the many different ways in which, because you see, God has chosen many different individuals. He's chosen different groups. He's even chosen angelic beings to fulfill his ultimate and perfect purpose, which will bring him the greatest amount of glory throughout all of eternity. All of creation, as we said this morning, will bend the knee and bow before the Lord Jesus Christ, even Satan, because the Bible tells us Everything in heaven, everything in earth, everything under the earth, it's all going to bow down and give glory to God the Father. Even the devil will have to break the knee and bow. God will crush him. It will take more to crush him than it does some poor drunken gutter bum. But God will crush him. God is omnipotent and Satan is not. Satan is merely a creature and he will not stand before the Almighty. The elect are no longer under the condemnation that uh, falls upon the non-elect. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? 
It is God that justifieth. They can accuse us all they want, but if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are justified by faith. That means you are declared righteous by faith because by faith you have also had the righteousness of Christ imputed to you. Imputation and justification are not the same. Imputation is the doctrine whereby you are made righteous by the blood of Christ. Justification is where you are declared righteous by God because the righteousness of Christ has been transferred to your account. And it is God who declares you righteous. So nobody can lay anything to the charge of God's elect. But you say, well, then that means I can live any old way that I want to, right? No, because the elect have obligations as to how they will live. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, here's what you're supposed to be wearing, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing and forgiving one another. I mean, he goes on and he gives you a list. The obligations, if you are among God's elect, it doesn't mean you're scot-free with no obligations, that you can go out and live like you want to. He says, no, there's going to be a transformation in your life. And these are the kinds of things that are going to show up in the lives of those who are truly his elect. It's one of the ways by which we do what's called fruit testing or fruit inspecting. People claim to be Christians, but if no fruit ever shows up in their lives, or if only plastic fruit is hung on their trees, you know they're not saved. God knows the heart, but God has made it visible so that we as other believers will be able to see which ones are phonies and which ones are real Christians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. If we, let us live in the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Walking by faith, walking in the Spirit, those are synonymous. Those are ways in which God flows His Spirit through us and produces this beautiful fruit which reaches others. If it's not there, it means the person is not a believer. Jesus said so in Matthew chapter 7, By their fruit ye shall know them. By their fruit ye shall know them. He goes on, he says, You know, there will be many in that day that say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? We cast out demons, we did miracles, we did mighty many works in your name. And Jesus will say, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and, your angel, and, the, and his angels. I never knew you. What you were doing was fake. There's a lot of that going on in the charismatic movement today. Oh, they're doing signs and wonders. And someday they're going to say, hey, why don't we get in? What you were doing was fake. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The miraculous stuff can be faked. Today I had lunch with a family that had a little kid, and I did one of these tricks. I don't have any marbles up here, but, you know, whereby I took it, stuck it in my mouth, rolled it around in my mouth, and pulled it out of my stomach. <laughs> Slide of hand. There's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on in the charismatic movement. It's fake. Or it's empowered by Satan, and Jesus says, depart. The elect have an obligation as to how they will live. Number eight, God specifically appoints certain Christians to preach the gospel to the elect. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Paul talks about it, how God gave him this obligation to preach to the elect. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Our time is up again, but I give you one more verse. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. He was a servant. He was an apostle so that he could reach God's elect. I don't know who the elect are. You don't know who the elect are. 
Before they're saved, we have no way of knowing who they are. And so God has committed to us the proclamation of the gospel, that Jesus Christ, God the Son, came to earth through the virgin birth, took upon him the form of a man, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also hath highly exalted, Philippians chapter 2, I read it to you this morning, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's our Lord. That's the one who has called us for a purpose, to live holy lives, to live fruitful lives, to live obedient lives, to share the good news with those who have not heard, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Finally, and we don't have time to develop this tonight, but we'll go on with it, Lord willing, next week with election and predestination and how these tie in with all here but only some believe, as we see over in Acts chapter 2, I mean Acts chapter 28, uh, verses 17 through 24. But election is tied to foreknowledge. We find election in Scripture tied to foreknowledge. That's not fatalism. Foreknowledge means that God knew all possible scenarios and he chose the one that most perfectly glorifies him. Foreknowledge does not mean, as the Arminians teach, it does not mean that God looked down the corridors of time, saw what would happen, and then chose on that basis. He looked down and said, oh yeah, Joe's going to believe down there, so I guess I'll choose him because he's already going to believe. Uh, a little farther down, oh, I see Mary's going to believe, so I, you know, okay, I'll choose her. Oh, 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 there's Sam over there. He's going to believe, so I guess I'll choose him. No, that's not what foreknowledge means. It doesn't mean that God just knew what was going to happen. Because nothing would have happened had God not chosen to create and to create a specific couple, man, uh, man and woman, Adam and Eve, who had specific genetic structure, who had specific genome, who had specific sperm and eggs, who produced specific children. There's no accident as to which egg descends at which time and which sperm is released to fertilize the egg. There were no accidents through all of history. Otherwise, Jesus Christ could not have been prophesied to come into this world. There are no accidents with God. Foreknowledge means that God made specific choices because he knew what would be the end result of every different choice that he could possibly make. And he chose one specific line of events to most perfectly glorify himself. In other words, the wrong idea makes God subject to history. That's a totally false premise. If you say God just looked down the corridors of time, saw what would happen, and chose on that basis, that's making God subject to history. But that is not true. History is subject to God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, our final verse for tonight. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Did you get that phrase? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Here's how God did it. Through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification merely means to set apart. That's a choice that God made. Unto, here's the purpose. Unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, God decided who would receive that benefit. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Well, we're seven minutes past time now, so I'm going to have to stop. But the Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. All here, but only some believe. Why do only some believe? Because God exercised mercy. He was not obligated to choose any of us. He could have in perfect righteousness sent every one of us to hell. But he chose to exercise mercy on some. To redeem those who could never save themselves. And you know where he began looking? Not at the top of the pile. Not with all the great and mighty ones. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians. The base things of the world, 
The things are despised. The things that are nothing are the ones that God chose so that in the end he gets the greatest amount of glory. Uh, people, that tells us where we are. That explains why if you're saved, you got saved, is because God did trash picking. And he picked from the bottom of the barrel to show that he is great, that he can transform that which is refuse into that which is one of his children. He chose us, and ultimately, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, and them he glorified. No room for boasting. No room for pride. No room for haughty arrogance. That God might receive all the glory. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your powerful word. It does not strike a resonant chord with our flesh because our flesh hates anything that doesn't put the flesh first. Our, hate flesh is, our flesh hates anything that doesn't give man the glory. Our flesh hates everything that says that we're trash. And yet God redeemed us because we were trash and couldn't help ourselves. And oh, that causes us to want to thank him, causes us to want to worship him, causes us to love him, because otherwise we would have no hope. Thank you, Father, for your word and for its power. We pray that you will take it and apply it to our hearts, to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.